with our social psychologist at NYU Stern School of Business and author of The Anxious Generation, Jonathan Heights, host of CNN's Fareed Zakaria GPS and author of the new book, The Age of Revolution, Fareed Zakaria, and former Secretary of Defense. His memoir is a sacred oath, Dr. Mark Esper. Such an esteemed panel, and here are the questions that people have sent in. For Fareed, why do you say that oil-rich countries have a hard time modernizing? Well, it, it's sort of like, think of trust fund kids uh, not working hard. <laughs> Basically, if you have, if you have, you know, if you don't need to go through the hard work of modernizing your economy, educating your population, putting in the right infrastructure, if all you have to do is dig a hole, get oil, sell it to, to you know, America and Europe, it's, it's the easy way out. And it's one of the reasons why you've seen in almost every oil-rich uh, country, Nigeria, Venezuela, you know, uh, Iran, Kuwait. there's, a, there, there's yeah. a dysfunction, there's corruption. And if you look at the countries that have really done well in the world, South Korea, Singapore, Hong Kong, Japan, they had no resources. So they had no alternative but to, you know, educate their population, build good infrastructure, put in place market-friendly rules, and guess what? You, you know, you get a boom. Is it, is it a function of the government? Or the fact, I mean, the United States is an energy-rich country. Yes. Norway, right? Uh, Killing it in energy, yes. Killing it in energy. And so, the, so there are a few, exactly right, there are a few countries where we got our political and economic system first, and then the oil came much later. Right. And that turns out to help yeah. a lot. You know? Right, because there seems to be no way to have the oil without it just being siphoned off by that corrupt cabal at the top. Right? Exactly, it, it, exactly. It, it, so, these, so what all these countries could be right. very doing very well. Absolutely. Right. And by the way, in, in the, all, all the, the Saudis ones are trying, actually. The Saudis are trying, and the, the, the small Gulf trying states what? are so small to modernize. To modernize, and, yeah. invest in their human capital, right. to you know, not pay a stipend right. to every royal right. who's on the payroll. But to just give you, you yeah. know, yeah. In, 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 the, in, the, in the Gulf, labor productivity, that is, you know, the productivity of every person who works, is among the lowest in the right. world. And, and it's not so, national labor either, it's import no, labor. Right. So, it's, so far it's not working. <laughs> All right, John, how does phone use and time on social media lead to a spiritual degradation? Spiritual degradation, yeesh. Well, because if you... <laughs> oh, that sounds terrible. <laughs> It does. Why? Yeah. So if you look at what, what ancient wisdom tells us, if you look at what the religious traditions and, and the Stoics, if you look at all these traditions, they tell us things like be slower to judge and quicker to forgive. They tell us things like slow down, calm down, regain control of your consciousness. And what is life on social media? It's exactly the opposite. Right. Judge right now, quick, no context, many times, never forgive. And it's how about hooking up your, your eyes and your ears to a gigantic fire hose and just pumping it full of garbage all the time? I, I've, I've said it so many times on this show, but I'm going to say it again. The phone takes everybody's worst um, innate feelings and makes them worse. Shady, needy, <clears throat> mean, fake, passive aggressive. If you have any of those... That's what, that's what anonymity gets you, right? That, that, that makes it worse. Yeah. I, I've often wondered if you said everybody who has an account, you can't use any avatars, any fake yeah. names, but you have to have, use your real name and oh. your real location. And no so filters. Very, but, yeah, but even, if, even if we let people, even if we let people use fake names for privacy's sake, at least companies, at least the platforms, should have some sort of authentication so that they know right. it's a real person. It's not, a, you know, a, a, right. a Russian agent trying to manipulate us. Mm -hmm. So even that would make it a lot better. Mm -hmm. But, but, but I think, think about, you know, Bill, you must have the same experience, you know. I, I'm out there in the world with my views, and I've traveled, you know, I travel around, give, people are very polite, people are very, in are, person, are very generous yes. in, in person. person. Right. But on Twitter, or, right. you know, on, on social media, it's a whole different thing, because suddenly you gain this nastiness. It's the point I think John is making. You may gain this nastiness when you have this platform where you can do it quietly, pseudonymously. It's, it's very interesting to think about the contrast at least I've noticed between people coming up to you in person mm -hmm. and what you get from their Twitter feed. Yeah, okay. Uh, what does the panel think of RFK Jr.'s choice in running mate, Nicole Shanahan? Okay, well, if you missed this... Who? Yeah. I, 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 didn't, I, I, didn't, I didn't know the name either. Then I it was vaguely familiar because I read the gossip about it some time ago. She is the ex-wife of Sergey Brin, who is one of the mm -hmm. co-owners of Google, 10th richest man in the world, 
Uh, the rumor was they split up because she had an affair with Elon Musk. That's just a rumor. I have no idea. They both deny it. I'm just putting it out there because you're going to see it out there. Anyway, RFK chose her as his VP, which is out of the box. You got to say that. Um, obviously, people are first thing people are going to say is, well, now he has access to billions of dollars. Yeah. In a way, it's kind of honest. Like, let's cut out the middleman. Uh, it's, you know, vice president. Right. You know, instead of it's like making Sheldon Adelson your vice president. Let's just, just, just let's go right to the, right. you know. Right. So let's, let, let's let's just remember that it only helps in this one country. There is no other advanced democracy in the world with campaign finance laws that would allow a multi-billionaire to spend, and you can spend billion dollars electing yourself. Berlusconi it, didn't do that? No, no, you know, they're very, they're very tight campaign laws in all of Europe. No, Silvio Berlusconi not. in Italy did not, he did not buy that presidency the same way we do? No, 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 he's, he was, was just actually... just coincidence he was the richest man in Italy who also <laughs> owned all the, the media. media. Right. He owned the media, that helped, that helped us oh, out, helped. but there are campaign laws. We are the only country where you can spend essentially unlimited amounts on yourself. The, the interesting point about RFK is he, he's polling at 12 percentage points right now when Trump is up beating Biden by about five nationally. Right. So where are those 12 points coming from? That's the question, and that's why everybody's trying to push him one way or the other. So, so the, the question is, is it, you know, is it going to be like Ralph Nader? Right. Where Nader t there are some people who think, on the other hand, since RFK's platform seems to be conspiracy theories, maybe he's drawing from the Trump that's vote. Yeah. I, I, don't, I, I don't think we know for sure. Okay, what will the fallout be from the ISIS attack in Moscow? Yes, if you missed that story, ISIS attacked Moscow. Hey, they hate somebody other than us. <laughs> There's always some good news in all the news, right? Look, I, I, I think it says a few things. First of all, ISIS has international reach beyond, you know, where they're based in either Afghanistan or Pakistan, right. or wherever, number one. And number two, they're able to elude most intelligence services except for ours. Apparently, we knew about it. And look, it's been a tragic attack, 137 or so Russians killed. But here's my point. What not was the goal? Not taking away anything from the tragedy, though. Russia's been killing Ukrainians for two plus years now, bombing with rockets and missiles and drones, maternity wards and hospitals and everything else. But ISIS so, didn't do it to defend Ukraine. No, they, it, no, they didn't. Look, no, they've, I, I, Russia has a long history of, of very brutal subjugation of Islamic militants. Think, think Chechnya like in the early in Chechnya and Dagestan, yeah. and mm -hmm. this is payback for Syria. Don't forget, the Russians allied with Assad, the government of Syria, when he faced um, militant Islamic, uh, uh, you know, kind of insurgency, and they were pretty brutal. So Putin has been, uh, you know, one of the, the enemy, em, enemy number one or two or three for, for these guys for a long time. The really interesting part about it... It's, though, not, a, it's not a false flag operation. No. It really... no, no. I mean, it seems like I think Mark's point is, is very important, which is the U U.S. intelligence warned the Russians not only of a possible ISIS attack, but that it might be in a theater. They, they had very good intelligence. I mean, I think it's a... Comp you know, we keep talking about how terrible the U.S. government is. On, on this, on Ukraine, U.S. intelligence has done pretty well. Here's what Putin's going to do with it, though, and he's, you already see this happening. He's going to blame the Ukrainians, and the view is he's going to use it to uh, do another mass mobilization of 200, 300,000 Russians to throw into the meat grinder that we call Ukraine. Hmm. So keep an eye out for that. What does the panel think of Sam Bankman-Fried being sentenced to 25 years in prison? Is that just? Um, I don't know. Far, I really, obviously, I, far less than what the prosecutors wanted, but 25 years is a long time. I don't, uh, I don't know if he gets off for good behavior. Uh, I, but I just wish I'd love to hear what John thinks yeah. about it. I think it, it's really encouraging because one of, the, one of the problems with the global financial crisis and the meltdown here is that pretty much nobody went to jail. And I think that really contributed to the disillusion, to the sense that the elites can get away with what they want, nobody gets punished. And here you have a guy who is just such an obvious fraudster, and so at least the system worked in this case. But the whole thing is a fraud. How can you have fraud with, I mean, I'm not saying he shouldn't be in jail, but the whole thing is just funny money. It's based on nothing. I was hoping it would go away because of this. I mean, it's, it's the only thing that people it's good for are criminals. Yeah, I, I agree, and I don't get it, but as you say, it, Bitcoin is at you know, 70,000 right now. And it's horrible for yeah, the environment. Yeah, yeah. The amount of electricity they Data need yeah. to do this mining. Yeah. It's a little bit like Trump. You, you, know, you, can, you can point this out all you want and he just keeps... <laughs> <laughs> I agree. All right, thanks, guys. Thank you, audience. We'll see you next week.